Hello, my name is Harriet Paul Teal. I'm based at Children's Hospital Boston, and I'll be lecturing today about sonographic imaging of the acute pediatric abdomen. Acute abdominal pain is a common, nonspecific symptom that is characterized by the development of severe abdominal pain over several hours. It's typically associated with self-limited minor conditions, particularly gastroenteritis and viral syndromes. The challenge for us as imagers is to identify those patients with the following disorders, namely serious, potentially life-threatening conditions such as appendicitis and bowel obstruction, infections requiring specific treatment such as urinary tract infection and pneumonia, and unusual manifestations of less common diseases such as hemolytic uremic syndrome and henoch schonlein purpura. The cause of acute abdominal pain will vary with the age of the patient, and the role of imaging is to determine whether this pain requires medical or surgical intervention. We try to provide a precise diagnosis if possible, and generally this will require uh, the use of plain radiography, ultrasound, and at times cross-sectional imaging such as CT or MRI. Causes of acute abdominal pain in the infant beyond the neonatal period importantly include trauma, and this includes inflicted injury, intussusception, strangulated inguinal hernia, and hemolytic uremic syndrome. In the older child and adolescent, important causes are trauma, acute appendicitis, mesenteric adenitis, inflammatory bowel disease, henoch schonlein purpura, cholelithiasis and cholecystitis, acute pancreatitis, acute pyelonephritis, urolithiasis, and pneumonia. Let's talk about trauma. This includes motor vehicle accidents, falls, and child abuse. Intraabdominal injuries may be life-threatening. There may be hemorrhage from solid organ laceration or fluid loss, organ ischemia from vascular injury, infection from perforated hollow viscous. Imaging in hemodynamically stable patients is what we perform, and CT is the usual modality. The so-called FAST scan, or focused abdominal sonography for trauma, performed in emergency departments in adults, has not worked out very well uh, for children. It's relatively poor in, in detecting abdominal organ injury in children, although in the future there may be a role uh, for the FAST scan if it is performed in conjunction with ultrasound contrast agents, but that's something for the future and not the here and now. I, I'm not going to uh, delve in any detail uh, into uh, a discussion of trauma, since CT really is uh, the main imaging modality, but I would like to point out um, that at times we are on the front lines and do make the initial assessment with ultrasound. Here, for example, um, is a case of a 10-year-old girl who had a bicycle handlebar injury to the chest. And you can see on the far left, um, one of her kidneys, which is swollen in the upper pole and has a central hyperechoic region. On the transverse image, we see that right kidney and the gallbladder anterior to it. And the margins of the kidney are poorly defined and poorly distinguished from the surrounding soft tissues. And that's because there is a perirenal hematoma. And um, on the image of the bladder, you can see that there is a fluid debris level, and this is presumably hemorrhage into the bladder um, arising from the um, upper, uh, upper tract the, from the kidney and extending down into the bladder. When we examine this kidney with power Doppler, we see that the lower pole is well perfused, but there is a perfusion defect in the upper pole corresponding to the hyperechoic region seen by grayscale ultrasound. And on CT, we can now readily um, visualize the uh, intrarenal hematoma as well as the uh, prominent perirenal uh, hemorrhage as well.
Here's another 10-year-old boy who fell um, and had a, had a bicycle handlebar injury, this time to the epigastrium. And um, on these uh, two images uh, obtained in the epigastric region, we can see that there is a very large complex fluid collection um, anterior to the body of the pancreas, which is compressed. And uh, in the pelvis, we can see that there is a fair amount of um, free fluid. And this is a patient who developed a pseudocyst as a result of a rupture or a laceration of the pancreas. And uh, here we see it again on CT, a very complex uh, fluid collection uh, related to uh, pancreatic laceration. Let's move on now to a discussion of intussusception, which is the most common abdominal emergency in early childhood. It usually occurs in children aged uh, two months to two years. And um, intussusception occurs when a proximal bowel segment, the so-called intussusceptum, invaginates into a distal bowel segment, the intussuscipients, along with the associated mesentery. This results in venous and lymphatic congestion, which can lead to edema, ischemia, perforation, and peritonitis. And here we have a surgical um, uh, image, an image obtained at the time of surgery, where we can see um, the intussusception and we see the very distended uh, recipient loop, which is also a little uh, slightly dusky in appearance. The majority of intussusceptions are idiopathic. A pathological lead point is identified in only about a quarter of cases, and most commonly um, these lead points are a Meckel's diverticulum, a polyp, and a duplication cyst, all benign entities, and um, small bowel lymphoma can also occur as a lead point. The site of intussusception is usually near the ileocolic junction, so-called ileocolic intussusception. The classic triad of pain, palpable, sausage-shaped abdominal mass, and current jelly stool only occurs in a minority of patients, about 15%. Um, for those people who are not familiar with current jelly stool, here is uh, an image of uh, a patient who was bleeding from the rectum, and the appearance has been likened to that of current jelly. This is a patient with an intussusception. We see on the plain radiograph that there's a paucity of bowel gas. There is a soft tissue mass in the transverse colon. And if you look very carefully, you can see a rounded uh, soft tissue um, structure here with a lower density center. And that's due to the uh, mesentery, which contains a large amount of fat. On the right are two images, longitudinal and transverse, of a typical intussusception where we see multiple layers of bowel wall. Everyone knows the bowel is a tube and ordinarily, normally, we can identify multiple layers, but here there are too many, too many layers because you have one bowel loop inside another, so you have twice as many layers as you would normally expect. You can also appreciate that there's probably a little bit of fluid here between the intussuscipians and the intussusceptum. Here's the patient at the time of reduction, which we perform um, with air. So uh, the transverse colon, you can see the intussusception. Here is the cecum, and the intussusception is in the region of the ileocecal valve. And then on the final image, it has been reduced, and we document this occurrence by the presence of uh, free reflux of air into the distal small bowel, as you see here. Here's another patient with intussusception resulting in small bowel obstruction. On the left, you see multiple dilated uh, small bowel loops. On the upright view, you can appreciate multiple air fluid levels, uh, no air within the rectum. And here's another typical appearance of intussusception, the multiple rings um, outlined here uh, by the blood vessels within the wall of the bowel. Uh, we see the intussusception with a small uh, crescent of fluid, which is also quite characteristic. Occasionally we can suspect that there is a lead point as we do here on this transverse view. I think you 
would agree that you can see a lesion on a stalk. Here's the stalk and here's the head of the lesion. Um, this is a patient who was studied with barium. Uh, we see the um, intussusception uh, as a filling defect within the column of barium. There's a coiled spring appearance, which is typical with barium in the interstices of the bowel wall. And here at surgery, uh, we see the lesion everted and inverted, and this was a Meckel's diverticulum. Next, let's talk about inguinal hernia. This occurs in 1 to 5% of all newborns, and inguinal hernia repair is the most commonly performed surgical procedure in children. Most are minimally symptomatic. However, incarcerated hernia cannot be reduced by manipulation. And the term strangulation is used when there is vascular compromise of an incarcerated hernia due to edema caused by venous and lymphatic obstruction. Prolonged strangulation may lead to necrosis and bowel perforation. Here is an image of a child with a very large scrotal hernia. And on the sagittal image with the head to our left and the uh, feet to our right, we see a bowel loop uh, passing through the inguinal canal through a patent processus vaginalis into the scrotal sac and abutting the testicle on, that, on the same side. It has been said that the presence of peristalsis favors viable bowel. Um, I think we can appreciate peristalsis here in this movie clip, whereas uh, the absence of peristalsis is uh, suggestive of um, strangulation, uh, compromise of the blood supply uh, uh, to the bowel loop. Here's another um, interesting case of a patient who had an incarcerated inguinoscrotal hernia, and um, we can see it here on this transverse image of the right hemiscrotum. This um, echogenic tissue is mesenteric fat that's herniated down into the scrotum, and this is the right testicle. On your right, you'll notice that the echogenicity of that right testicle is very um, hypoechoic relative to the asymptomatic left testis. And this testicle was in fact ischemic and the patient complained not only of abdominal pain due to the incarcerated hernia, but also had very severe scrotal pain and was taken to surgery um, because of a clinical diagnosis of testicular torsion. Um, and had the uh, hernia not been repaired in a timely manner, he almost certainly would have gone on to um, infarct his testicle because the hernia was compromising the vascular supply to that testicle, as you can appreciate well on the color Doppler. Notice the um, prominent blood flow to the normal testis on the left. I'd like to turn now to a discussion of hemolytic uremic syndrome. This is a disease of infancy and early childhood that is usually caused by infection with shiga toxin producing E. coli. It is acquired from contaminated food or water and occurs five to 10 days after the onset of bloody diarrhea. The toxin damages the GI endothelial cells and initiates intravascular thrombosis. The toxin enters the circulation via the GI mucosa and localizes in the kidneys and destroys the renal cells. Cellular damage leads to microvascular thrombosis and platelet consumption. There is mechanical damage to the red blood cells circulating through the partially occluded microcirculation. And clinically, the patients will present with oliguria, hematuria, renal failure, thrombocytopenia, and microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. Here is a six-year-old girl with um, abdominal pain and bloody diarrhea. You'll notice that the imaged bowel loops are very abnormal in appearance. They're very thickened, particularly at the level of the submucosa, this um, echogenic uh, layer of the bowel wall. And uh, there's martyperemia as well with color Doppler. Her kidney that we see here um, is very echogenic. The parenchyma is very echogenic in comparison to that of the adjacent liver. Normally, the renal parenchymal 
echogenicity is less than that of the uh, adjacent liver. So this is highly abnormal. And um, over here we have an arterial waveform from the main renal artery, again, highly abnormal. Instead of seeing flow throughout diastole, uh, antegrade flow throughout diastole, instead we have a systolic peak and then a very rapid uh, diminution of flow and actual flow reversal through most of diastole. So a highly abnormal arterial waveform within the kidney. On to a discussion of acute appendicitis. This is the most common pediatric surgical emergency, comprising about 80% of all pediatric surgical emergencies. And importantly, about one-third of children have an atypical presentation. The clinical diagnosis is often difficult since many non-surgical conditions may mimic acute appendicitis. These patients can be imaged by ultrasound, or CT, or even MRI in pregnant patients, for example. Um, but certainly in the United States, um, the majority of cases uh, are studied with CT. And this is a problem in the pediatric population. Children are particularly sensitive to radiation, and there's a potentially long period during which radiation-induced tumors uh, would have an, have an opportunity to develop. So uh, certainly um, there is an effort being made on part of the pediatric radiology um, community, and I think this is spilling over to, uh, uh, to the adults as well, to try to optimize the um, performance and interpretation of um, ultrasound examinations for acute appendicitis and to only perform CT um, when it's absolutely necessary and there's no other way of obtaining the information that we need to treat the patients. So here's an example of a patient with an acute appendicitis. You'll notice that the appendix is um, um, distended with some fluid. It's not compressible. I don't have calipers here, but it measured more than six millimeters from outer wall to outer wall. On this sagittal view of the pelvis, we see a little bit of free fluid in the cul-de-sac. This patient is early on in their course, so when we study the appendix with color Doppler, we see that it, the appendix is hyperemic. Um, if the appendix were to ne become necrotic, then we would no longer um, be able to depict blood flow in the wall. Here's a transverse image of that appendix, again, non-compressible, filled with fluid. Here's a different patient um, where we see the appendix. It's quite a long appendix, and it has uh, a stone at the tip, which we see as an echogenic focus with distal shadowing. Here's an example of a patient who had a perforated appendix at surgery. We can identify the appendix here. Uh, and then at its tip, there's a small irregular fluid collection. Here we see it in transverse section, surround, the appendix surrounded by a bit of fluid. With color Doppler, there's a little bit of flow along one edge, but not uniformly hyperemic as we saw in the earlier example. Here's a patient who had perforated some time before the ultrasound study was done. We were not able to identify the appendix, although we did see an echogenic focus with distal shadowing, which may uh, have represented the appendicolith lying free um, in the peritoneum. It is surrounded by um, echogenic fat. It's become walled off. Uh, there is some fluid, and you'll notice that the bowel loops in that region um, are mildly dilated. They're atonic. Um, when color Doppler is used, there is increased f blood flow to these tissues. So this is a fairly typical appearance of peritonitis um, following perforation, in this case, um, of an appendix. Here's one patient where ultrasound um, was not helpful, uh, where we really could not visualize the appendix. And, of course, it's always helpful to try to... Um, improve visualization, and one way of doing that is to turn the patient on their side, to compress, to try to squeeze out any air in the bowel loops, to um, 
improve the, uh, the accuracy of the study. Here you can see on this transverse image that there, here's the bladder, that there's a very large amount of bowel gas in that right lower quadrant, and there was no way that we could see the appendix. Here is uh, just another image showing the iliac vessels. This patient subsequently had a CAT scan, which very readily showed a retrocecal appendix containing a stone. So here CT was immensely helpful in elucidating the patient's disease. Let's talk a bit about mesenteric adenitis. This is an inflammatory condition with symptoms similar to that of acute appendicitis, namely abdominal pain, fever, and an elevated white blood cell count. It's the most common diagnosis in children who are found to have a normal appendix at surgery. Um, it can be divided into primary and secondary forms. The primary form is more common in children than adults and is believed to be related to an underlying infectious terminal ileitis. Secondary mesenteric adenitis is quite common. We often see enlarged um, lymph nodes in conjunction with other inflammatory processes such as appendicitis and inflammatory bowel disease. And the role of imaging is to attempt to exclude an associated inflammatory process when these enlarged inflamed lymph nodes are identified. Here's a 10-year-old boy where there was a question of an acute appendicitis. Um, we could see multiple enlarged lymph nodes in the right lower quadrant but could not identify the appendix. A CAT scan was done which did readily show um, the appendix seen here posterior to the cecum, posterolateral. There are some enlarged right lower quadrant lymph nodes. Here's another patient with um, a clinical diagnosis of gastroenteritis. Again, multiple enlarged hyperemic lymph nodes. Um, a single bowel loop shown here with a mildly thickened wall, um, which um, goes along with the diagnosis of gastroenteritis. Here we see some fluid-filled bowel loops as well. Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis are the most common forms of inflammatory bowel disease that we um, image. Neither disease usually presents primarily with acute abdominal pain. In children, the main um, studies, diagnostic studies, include plain films, endoscopy, and contrast radiography. Although we certainly are trying to image more of these patients with sonography, with color Doppler, and we hope in the future in children to be able to use contrast agents as well, ultrasound contrast agents, although at this point uh, we here in America have, don't have that um, option uh, readily available to us. Um, acute presentations in patients with inflammatory bowel disease um, in childhood are usually due to complications um, in patients who have chronic disease. And these um, complications uh, include postoperative adhesions, an abscess due to perforation or a fistula, and toxic megacolon in patients with ulcerative colitis. Here's a patient who did present um, for the first time acutely with abdominal pain and weight loss, and we can see that there are thickened bowel loops. Notice the submucosa is quite thickened and with color Doppler hyperemic, and we do see this fat um, adjacent to the inflamed uh, bowel, uh, which is also characteristic of Crohn's disease. Here are some CT images of the same patient, a very typical appearance of terminal ileitis. Uh, we do see enlarged uh, lymph nodes and the prominent uh, vasculature and uh, mesenteric vessels and nodes as well. Here's a different patient who presented with abdominal pain as part of a Crohn's flare and perirectal pain. These are images of the perineum. The patient is prone. Um, the skin surface is uh, superiorly here. There's a large um, abscess uh, fluid, abnormal fluid collection. Uh, here we see a um, fistula extending uh, to the skin surface.
in real time, and of course, uh, hyperemia of the soft tissues. This patient did go on to have a CAT scan. We can see the uh, abscess and uh, fistula as well to the skin. Henoch-Schönlein purpura is an immune complex mediated vasculitis of small vessels that affects multiple organ systems. It's the most common vasculitis of childhood and 50 to 60% of patients develop abdominal pain from intestinal intramural hemorrhage and they can hemorrhage from the stomach into the stomach, the small intestine, and the colon. The GI tract symptoms may precede the characteristic purpuric skin rash, which you can see here on the right, a very florid example of that. Ultrasound depicts intramural hemorrhage and is useful in follow-up. And small bowel intussusception is a common complication. These are images of a four-year-old boy with um, Henoch-Schönlein purpura and abdominal pain. In his left upper quadrant, he had this peculiar um, appearance of the bowel. Uh, here we see it uh, again, and with real time, we can appreciate uh, that this patient does indeed have uh, a, an intussusception. It's a small bowel to small bowel intussusception. On to cholelithiasis and cholecystitis. Gallstones are relatively uncommon in children, only affecting about 1.5% and occur mainly in adolescent girls. There's often an identifiable underlying cause. Patients who are treated with TPN are prone to develop stones that resolve when oral feeding is instituted. Acute cholecystitis is much less common than in adults, with an absence of gallstones in about half the cases. And a calculus cholecystitis often occurs in critically ill patients. Here are images of a three-year-old boy who was being weaned off TPN and he developed acute abdominal pain and fever. You can see that his gallbladder is distended with fluid. The wall is thick. His common bile duct is dilated. And he has a small gallstone this echogenic focus with distal shadowing, a small gallstone in the neck of his gallbladder. With color Doppler, we can see that the wall is quite hyperemic, and this patient ultimately needed surgery for acute appendicitis. There's also some sludge within the gallbladder lumen. This is a different child, a seven-year-old boy who had been otherwise well when he developed severe right upper quadrant pain, uh, had cholestasis, and abnormal liver function tests. And here's his gallbladder, which is strikingly abnormal in appearance, a very thickened, heterogeneous uh, wall, lots of internal uh, debris and uh, martyperemia. He also required cholecystectomy and had a pathological diagnosis of acalculus cholecystitis. Acute pancreatitis is characterized by the sudden onset of abdominal pain and a rise in serum levels of amylase and lipase. A significant proportion of patients initially have normal serin enzymes, and by definition, these patients uh, eventually will undergo a complete structural and functional recovery. About a quarter of the cases in children are idiopathic. Another significant proportion, almost a quarter, are traumatic in etiology. With structural anomalies, a multi-systemic disease, drugs and toxins, and viral infection accounting for the remainder. Unfortunately, there is a recurrence in about 9% of patients with acute pancreatitis, and this can be really a devastating um, illness with a mortality rate in children of about 10%. These are images of a four-year-old girl with, um, with leukemia treated with asparaginase. On the left, we see um, the right kidney, the liver, and some free fluid in Morrison's pouch. On this middle image, we see the pancreas, which is swollen. It's mildly echogenic. And on the right, we see that there's a large amount of ascites within the abdomen. Here are some images of her CAT scan. Um, here's a very abnormal swollen pancreas. We can appreciate that there are foci of non-enhancement um, after contrast administration. And this was due to necrotizing pancreatitis and really a tremendous amount of ascites within the abdomen.
This is another girl, 17 years old, also with leukemia, treated with asparaginase. She has a very large um, extra pancreatic fluid collection, a pseudocyst, uh, very um, heterogeneous in appearance um, due to acute pancreatitis. Um, here is her bladder and her uterus with free fluid in the pelvis and also in um, the right pleural space. A few words about urinary tract disorders that can present with pain, acute pain in children, urinary tract infection, urolithiasis, and ureteropelvic junction obstruction. Um, ultrasound is used in the workup of initial urinary tract infections in children. Um, in urinary tract infections with palpable with a palpable abdominal mass or a UTI unresponsive to treatment. In the older child and adolescent, pyelonephritis often presents with fever, vomiting, flank pain, and an elevated white blood cell count. In the younger child, the um, symptoms are, are generally nonspecific. A right-sided acute pyelonephritis may mimic acute appendicitis. And importantly, um, acutely infected kidneys are often, or I would say almost always, normal by ultrasound. Um, sometimes they may be a little swollen, but that's usually the only finding that we see. Um, we do uh, reserve uh, and perform CT evaluation for imaging of suspected complications of pyelonephritis, such as abscess. Here's a four-year-old girl in whom an abscess was suspected. Um, here's her normal right kidney and her left kidney, which demonstrates a very swollen lower pole. Uh, the right kidney, when studied with power Doppler, um, shows uh, symmetric homogeneous blood flow, whereas there's very patchy flow on the affected side, but we don't see anything that suggests an abscess on the ultrasound. And this was confirmed on a CT, which was subsequently performed. You'll notice that the Involved kidney is much more swollen than the right, and it has the characteristic um, uh, wedge-shaped uh, foci of um, diminished perfusion that we see in pyelonephritis. Here's a, a different patient, a six-year-old girl with fever, abdominal and flank pain, not responding to antibiotics. Um, on the ultrasound examination, the upper pole is very swollen, uh, and now we can see in this patient that there is also a fluid um, a component uh, to uh, the abnormality in the upper pole. Um, with power Doppler, um, we see that this area is minimally perfused, a uh, large amount of fluid seen here on the transverse views, and this was an abscess. Urolithiasis um, is another topic to consider. Stones are usually due to infection with proteus or Klebsiella or metabolic disease in children. Uh, there is an increased frequency of stones in children who have anatomical or neurogenic urinary tract obstruction. An acute presentation in children is relatively uncommon and is usually discovered during investigation of nonspecific abdominal pain or UTI. Ultrasound is the first line imaging tool with CT reserved for those patients who may be very obese and it's hard to study them with ultrasound. Patients with severe scoliosis, again, where it's hard to get a good ultrasound image. Or um, in those cases where the renal ultrasound is negative and clinical suspicion for stone is high. Um, these are images of an eight-year-old boy with uh, mental retardation, cerebral palsy, and scoliosis. Um, you can see that in the images of the left kidney, there's an echogenic focus with distal shadowing. The right kidney appears to be normal. Um, when we look with color Doppler at that focus in the lower pole, we see a twinkle sign, which is very characteristic of renal stone. The patient went on to have a CAT scan. We can appreciate scoliosis and the lower pole stone, but in addition, um, CT did detect tiny stones both in the left and right kidneys, which were not apparent um, from the ultrasound. In this particular case, I'm not sure it changed the management, but um, uh, CT was helpful in elucidating the entirety of this patient's stone burden.
UPJ obstruction is the most common cause of congenital urinary tract obstruction uh, due to an abnormal development of a short segment of smooth muscle at the UPJ. Extrinsic lesions are responsible for some cases, um, and these lesions include aberrant vessels, fibrous bands, or adhesions. Nowadays, most cases of UPJ obstruction are diagnosed prenatally um, on prenatal sonography. However, um, it, can, it is an entity that can present at any age, and clinical findings in the older child include abdominal pain, hematuria, UTI, recur and recurrent flank pain. Uh, that may be associated with increased fluid intake. For example, adolescents who are drinking beer uh, may develop sudden pain due to the stress of the um, fluid overload. Um, patients engaged in sports who may get a blow to the flank and may bleed a little bit, and that can cause acute obstruction. Here's a six-year-old boy who had a urinary tract infection, hematuria, dysuria, and flank pain. We see his uh, dilated kidney, the calyces are filled with fluid. The lower pole calyx has a fluid debris level, um, perhaps related to hemorrhage. Um, you can see there's echogenic material, but it could just be um, debris related to stasis. It doesn't necessarily have to be hemorrhage. Here's a transverse view um, of the lower pole, and we see the dilated renal pelvis, and here's the bladder, there's a very slight dilation of the distal ureter that's not commensurate with the collecting system dilation. So these findings are in keeping with um, uh, an acute UPJ um, obstruction. Finally, I'd like to talk a little bit about pneumonia. Uh, lower lobe pneumonia is a well-recognized cause of abdominal pain. And when abdominal pain is accompanied by fever, a chest radiograph should be obtained. Adelect or consolidated lung um, permits transmission of the ultrasound beam, and the echogenicity of non-aerated lung is very similar to that of the liver. Air and fluid-filled bronchi can be depicted, and pulmonary necrosis, abscess, and pleural fluid are also readily identified. This is the chest radiograph of a 15-year-old girl who had pneumonia and bilateral pleural effusions that were not responsive to conventional treatment. It's hard to appreciate, but there actually is a little pigtail catheter here on the right. Here are her uh, ultrasound images of the right and left chest. On the right, you can see that there is a, um, a pleural effusion, uh, which is complex. It has a lot of echoes in it. We can look at it in real time here. You can appreciate the uh, echogenic material, and uh, it, these findings are even more striking. On the left here, we have a consolidated lung, a few little, air bron uh, a few little fluid bronchograms, and a very complex um, pleural fluid, again, which we can appreciate very well um, in real time. So these were loculated pleural effusions. Another patient also not responding to conventional therapy has um, uh, an area of opacification at the left lung base. Uh, not a big change um, on a decubitus film. This patient had a very complex uh, collection within the pleural space. Uh, we can appreciate uh, its adherence to the underlying lung but is separate from it. Um, here we see it in uh, real time. And um, at CT, uh, again, we can see this very complex fluid collection um, adjacent to the inferior portion of the left lung. And this was an empyema. So in conclusion, I have reviewed with you uh, the ultrasound features of the most common and important pathological entities in the infant and older child. And important points to remember are that the cause of acute abdominal pain varies according to patient age, and that ultrasound is a very useful modality in evaluation of acute abdominal pain. It's not invasive it does not involve ionizing radiation, and a specific diagnosis is often possible. Thank you.